Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us. Episode 39, Apollo Program Flight 6, Apollo 12, Part 1, Lightning Strikes Twice. Last time, we rode along as after years of monumental effort, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin became the first humans to walk on the moon. We learned a little bit about what they did on the surface, celebrated the historic nature of the trip, and learned that a felt-tip pen can always come in handy. Just in case you missed it, I put out a supplemental with some of the radio audio from Apollo 11. If you want to hear some famous words over a scratchy comm link, go check it out. To a lot of people in the general public, that was it. Mission accomplished. We had risen to the challenge, beaten the Soviet Union definitively, and injected a massive boost into the entire airspace industry. The whole public focus had been on that initial mission. Even today, that's still largely the case. This question may get a bit of a different answer with my audience, but if you were to ask random people on the street, how many people do you think would be able to name the third and fourth man on the moon? Or even the second? This flagging of public support and interest was a signal of the end of the beginning for NASA. There was still a lot of inertia there, but NASA changed when Apollo 11 landed. People who had spent every waking moment on the program began to move on to other challenges. Politicians, bureaucrats, and voters began to take a second look at NASA's budget, wondering what else they could use that money for. And NASA itself started making plans past the moon. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. NASA still had big plans on the moon. We weren't going to spend all that time and money only to call it a day with less than three hours spent walking on the surface. Today we'll be talking about the second piloted lunar landing, Apollo 12. Before we can get to the mission, we actually have a few new faces to welcome. Astronaut Group 7. On August 14th, 1969, Carol Bobko, Robert Crippen, C. Gordon Fullerton, Henry Hartsfield Jr., Robert Overmeyer, Donald Peterson, and Richard Truly joined the already somewhat cramped bench of astronauts in waiting. Astronaut boss Deke Slayton wasn't exactly thrilled about taking these seven guys on, but did so in order to preserve NASA's relationship with the Air Force. That's because these seven pilots were all that remained of the Air Force's Manned Orbiting Laboratory program. The MOL was supposed to be a manned spy satellite, but the program kept getting delayed and delayed, and eventually someone decided that robotic spy satellites were good enough. In the end, the only part of MOL that actually flew in space was when the Air Force refurbished the capsule from Gemini 2, cut a hatch into the heat shield, and sent it on a suborbital trajectory to see how the hatch heat shield did. The heat shield did fine, and the Gemini 2 spacecraft became only the second vehicle to fly in space twice, but that was it. The MOL crew had a long wait ahead of them, with none of them flying until the space shuttle, but all seven did eventually fly in space. Apollo 11 had proven the ability of the LEM to perform a lunar landing and return the crew safely, but it hadn't really done much else. Apollo 12 was the first of the H-type missions, which would focus on precision landing and expanding the scope of surface operations. Precision landing was especially important for what was planned in the later missions. Apollo 11's landing site had been primarily chosen with safety in mind. It was essentially a large, featureless plane. The sites the science community wanted to visit were all pretty tricky locations that would require a fair amount of precision. Want to land between a valley and a mountain range? You better have confidence that you could put it down where you plan to. With that in mind, Apollo 12 would try landing in a similarly safe open plane called the Ocean of Storms, but at a precise location. How do you judge the precision of a landing in a big open area? By landing at a landmark. In this case, the robotic lunar probe Surveyor 3, which had landed on the surface two and a half years earlier on April 20th, 1967. Landing near Surveyor 3 would allow an unequivocal metric of landing precision, and also allow scientists on the ground to learn how the probe held up in the harsh lunar environment. Apollo 12 would also expand on surface operations. Apollo 11's surface ops were essentially get out, grab a rock, plant a flag, huck some science experiments at the ground, and get out of there. With 12, the crew would deploy the full Apollo Lunar Surface Experiment Package, or ALSEP, as opposed to Apollo 11's more limited E-ALSEP, where the E stood for early. We'll get into the actual experiments a little bit later. 12 would be launching in November of 1969, just four months after the successful conclusion of 11. But the original plan actually called for a September launch. 
NASA had been planning a landing attempt every two months until success. But since Eleven worked on the first try, there was no need to continue to push the envelope and stress everyone out. Schedules were allowed to slacken a little to merely crazy instead of bonkers. The schedule slip also allowed the crew of Apollo 12 to have a little more time for last-minute training. Flying in the left seat as commander would be our old friend Pete Conrad. We know Conrad from his first mission as pilot flying alongside Gordo Cooper on Gemini 5, covered in episode 15. We last saw him commanding Gemini 11, riding the Agena to unprecedented heights as covered in episode 21. He had been heavily involved in the design and layout of the lunar module, and finally be given a chance to put all that effort to use. Sitting next to him in the center seat was command module pilot Dick Gordon. We know Gordon from his flight alongside Pete Conrad on Gemini 11. He was the one who straddled the Agena like some sort of crazy space cowboy before having to end the EVA early due to extreme exhaustion. That leaves the right seat with lunar module pilot and rookie astronaut Alan Bean. Bean was born on March 15, 1932 in Wheeler, Texas. He flew as a Navy pilot for a number of years in attack squadrons in Florida before attending the Naval Test Pilot School. While there, one of his instructors was a guy you may have heard of named Pete Conrad. After his stint at Test Pilot School, he returned to flying in attack squadrons, but also applied to be an astronaut. He didn't make the cut on Group 2, but joined in 1963 as part of Astronaut Group 3. Bean was originally slated to be part of the Apollo Applications missions, which would follow the lunar landing portion of the program. But when Clifton Williams was killed in a plane crash, Bean was moved onto the backup crew of Apollo 9 and suddenly found himself in the rotation. Conrad specifically requested Bean as a member of his crew. So remember kids, work hard and be nice to your teachers. Someday they may choose you to land on the moon with them. On November 14, 1969, all three men were in their couches at the top of the towering Saturn V, ready to add two more sets of footprints to the lunar regolith. The weather was not great, with rain and some distant lightning, but everything was within the mission rules, so the launch went ahead as scheduled at 11.22 a.m. For the first 36 and a half seconds, everything looked to be proceeding smoothly. Then, with the vehicle only about a mile off the pad, there was a flash of light, the master alarm sounded, and when the crew looked at their caution and warning lights, they saw enough lights to challenge a Christmas tree. Among others, all three fuel cells had disconnected. AC bus 1 and 2 were overloaded, and main bus A and B were down. Not good. At 52 seconds into the flight, another round of alarms sounded as the spacecraft's inertial guidance system was lost. Pete Conrad radioed down, Okay, we just lost the platform, gang. I don't know what happened here. We had everything in the world drop out. Let's take a step back and examine the current situation. Three guys are riding the largest rocket ever made, thundering into the sky, with no guidance system and half their systems failing. But the rocket is still going. When I first heard this story, my first thought was, why didn't the rocket just go spinning out of control? If you think back to episode 27, which covered the onboard computers, you'll recall that the Saturn V had its own onboard computer, separate from the Apollo spacecraft. The Apollo guidance computer would monitor the rocket's computer and could take over in a pinch, but they were separate systems. So while the command module had no idea where it was or what was going on, the Saturn V just kept on trucking, completely ignorant of the situation. While the crew and mission controllers scrambled to fix this problem, they still had to deal with the normal sequence of events. Right in the middle of all this, the first stage burned out, staging happened, and the S2 fired up. Shortly after that, Commander Pete Conrad hit the nail on the head when he radioed down, I don't know what happened. I'm not sure we didn't get hit by lightning. That is exactly what happened. In fact, it happened twice. The first strike fried some telemetry sensors and took down the fuel cells, which caused their own constellation of issues. The second strike took down the guidance platform. It was just luck that kept the Saturn V computer running, allowing the mission to continue. But it wasn't just due to bad luck that the spacecraft got hit by lightning in the first place. It turns out that it was generated by the passage of the rocket through the clouds. Observers even saw the first strike travel down the exhaust plume to the launch pad. Ever wonder why it's pretty rare for rockets to launch in bad weather? This is why. The fact that the spacecraft was freaking out was bad enough, but on top of that the telemetry to mission control was all scrambled. The screens in Houston were flooded with unintelligible garbage. Luckily for all involved, John Aaron was on console that day, serving as ECOM. 
Ecom was responsible for electronics, environment, and communications, so basically anything with electricity running through it on the spacecraft. Aaron recognized this unusual pattern on the screens from a test mission done months ago. Just on his own, he ran down the exact cause of the issue, and in doing so became one of the few people on Earth who could help with this situation. He called out, Flight, Ecom, set SCE to AUX. No one in Mission Control was sure what that was, but Capcom Gerald Carr dutifully relayed the message, telling the crew to set SCE to auxiliary. On the spacecraft, the onboard tape recorders that pick up what isn't said over the radio heard Pete Conrad asking, what the hell is that? But over in the right-hand seat, Alan Bean reached up to his panel, flipped a switch, and Houston began getting clean data again. Crisis averted. It turns out that SCE stood for Signal Conditioning Equipment and helped transmit the data to the ground. By switching it to auxiliary, it was able to work around some of the damage from the lightning strike and get the data flowing again. I love this incident because it really exemplifies what mission control is all about. Something unthinkable happened, the right guy was in the right place with the right answer, and the mission could continue. Those mission control guys really know their stuff. Hmm, someone should do a podcast episode about those guys someday. Incredibly, Apollo 12 arrived in its parking orbit largely intact, though the crew workload was unexpectedly increased. Before the translunar injection burn could take place, all the systems on the spacecraft would have to be verified and the guidance platform would have to be realigned manually. Fixing the platform fell to command module pilot Dick Gordon, who got to work right away, manning the sextant and locating specific stars. This was a race against time since the S-4B only had a limited window in which it could remain dormant and still fire up again. When the time came for TLI, all systems looked good. Gordon had gotten the platform back on track, and Apollo 12 was go for the moon. The only question was if the pyros that deployed the parachutes had been damaged by the lightning. There was no way to test this, but since there was also no way to fix it, mission controllers decided it didn't make a difference. If the parachutes were busted, they could abort from low Earth orbit, and the crew would die. Or they could go land on the moon, come back from lunar orbit, and the crew would die. But at least they got to walk on the moon first. TLI went off without a hitch, followed shortly by transposition and docking. For this mission, the entire crew were from the Navy, so they chose some classic ship names for their not-so-classic ships. The command module went by Yankee Clipper, and the lunar module was called Intrepid. Yankee Clipper and Intrepid, securely connected at the docking port, backed off from the S-4B. Once some distance had been built up, the S-4B was supposed to place itself in an orbit where it would swing by the moon and wander off into solar orbit. Instead, there was a minor problem, and it wound up in a super-high Earth orbit for a couple of years. Eventually, it did drift off into solar orbit, but not for good. In 2002, some astronomers thought they found a strange new asteroid. It was unusually bright, seemed to be cylindrical, and was tumbling. It even got an asteroid designation, J002E3. But it was no asteroid. It was the old S4B back for a visit. It looped around the Earth a few more times before the Earth kicked it back into solar orbit in 2003. Maybe it'll come back in another 30 years. The S-4B had placed Apollo 12 into the typical free return trajectory. That way, if the SPS engine failed, the crew would just loop around the moon and come right back. But for the first time on this mission, they would change to a non-free return trajectory. At one of the mid-course correction opportunities, the SPS fired up and changed its orbit to one that was more advantageous to the landing, but was not free return. The timing of all this was important. The S-4B placed them on a free return by default. By the time the change to non-free return took place, the LEM was part of the stack. If the SPS engine failed after their orbit had been changed, the LEM descent propulsion system should be able to get them back on track. As always, the scenarios had been thought through, and there were backup plans but it was still a bit of a scary step. As usual, though, the SPS ran like a champ. After the uneventful cruise out to the moon, Yankee Clipper and Intrepid slipped behind its western limb and out of communications range. When it passed around again, the SPS had done its job and lowered the spacecraft into its initial orbit. As we'll see, there were a number of small tweaks to the mission plan based on lessons learned from Apollo 11. One of the first was in regards to the undocking procedure. As you'll recall, Apollo 11 landed several miles downrange and also off to the side a bit. 
There were numerous reasons for this, but one was the pop gun effect of undocking the limb. Small amounts of air left over in the docking tunnel gave the Eagle a slight kick, which altered its orbit. When you're moving at these speeds, it doesn't take a big change to alter your landing point significantly. With that in mind, the undocking procedure had two minor tweaks. First, the stack was oriented radially, that is, pointed up and down vertically with respect to the lunar surface. That way, if there was any additional velocity imparted, it would not impact the vehicle's downrange or cross-range location. To be honest, I'm not sure why a radial impulse would be less impactful, but I'm still working on this whole orbital mechanics thing. The second tweak was to perform a soft undocking. The docking mechanism was a real piece of mechanical work, with its numerous latches and retraction mechanism. To perform a soft undock, the main set of 12 latches were disconnected first. Then the retraction mechanism pushed the limb out, still connected by the three latches of the probe. During normal docking, this was called soft dock, as opposed to hard dock when all the latches were engaged. Lastly, the three latches on the probe were disengaged and the limb was free. No pop guns in sight. Another change to this phase of the mission was that once Intrepid was free, it did not perform the same 360 degree yaw that Eagle did. This little dance was included on Eleven to give Mike Collins a chance to visually inspect the Eagle, but I guess it was decided that it wasn't worth the risk of orbital perturbations. One last change was that they ended the episode while still in lunar orbit instead of right after landing. Wait, that's a change to the podcast, not to the landing. I know, I know, we just got all the way out here and you're all ready to land. I hadn't planned on splitting this episode up, but when I emerged from my trance and took a look at the beast of an outline I had put together, it was just too much. So rather than rush this and skip interesting details, I figure we better call it here. Plus, in my book, there's no such thing as too many Apollo episodes. Join us in two weeks as we tackle the remainder of Apollo 12. We go inside the cockpit for the dramatic dusty landing, we go outside the LEM for not one but two surface EVAs, we deploy some experiments, vandalize a space probe, and find out who was the first man on the moon to say, whoopee! A quick note at the end here, I just wanted to say thanks to all of you who have been writing into the show. You can get in on the fun by hitting me up on Twitter, where I'm at Space Above Us, I dropped the the to save space, or on the show's Facebook page, facebook.com slash the space above us. There's also good old fashioned email where you can find me at jp at thespaceabove.us. And since I'm not sure I've actually ever mentioned it on the show, the podcast does have a website. If you go to the aforementioned thespaceabove.us, you can find links to the various ways to listen or to contact me, as well as a brief about section that shows me standing in front of the James Webb Space Telescope, which is pretty cool. I can't tell you how much it means to even know people are out there at all, let alone some of the amazing stuff that's been sent in. One guy wrote in to say that he works at a high school, recommended the show to the science teachers, and they now have some of the students listening. So, hello students, and a Snapchat fidget spinner Pokemon Go day to you. Those are all still cool, right? At Astra, catch you on the next pass.